Good morning, everyone, once again. So this is our second day of our four-day virtual refresher training on market analysis and development. And then I wanted to go quickly through the agenda today. So we're going to have a quick recap of um, our first day. And then we'll have a very short uh, discussion about the preparations for phase two of MAND. And then we will talk about the three different steps in phase two. So we talked yesterday about um, why we would want to build capacities for MAND. I'm not going to go through this again. I just highlighted in pink the most important bits. So you can see sustainability, you can see business incubation unit and FFPOs, you can see entrepreneurial thinking, et cetera. And then we also talked about the core principles, so the basic principles of MAND, such as its focus on empowerment and participation to allow entrepreneurs to build their skills in developing and, importantly, adapting and sustaining their business. And another important principle is that MAND is built on the idea of sustainability. And we talked about the five areas of business de development um, that I taken into consideration by the entrepreneurs in each phase of the development of their businesses. Um, another important principle of the MND approach um, is to help shift entrepreneurs' thinking and approach from selling to marketing. And we touch briefly on the importance of um, strategic alliances, but also we talked about the role of two very important players in the whole MAND process. So we talked about the role of um, FFPO business incubation units or support units that will um, play an important role, especially in the preliminary phase. Um, in um, uh, And I've highlighted here various items that are particularly important in gathering data around different products um, and uh, making sure that there are the necessary resources for the implementation of MAND available, um, where they would have to make sure that the environment is conducive to MAND. And they also play an important role in gathering and evaluating the facilitators and the EDPs that are produced throughout the process. And then we also talked about the role of the field facilitator, the second important player, apart from the entrepreneurs, of course. Um, and just highlighted here that the role of the facilitator really is in accompanying the entrepreneurs, not making decisions on behalf of the entrepreneur. So then we talked about some key activities in this very important pre preliminary phase. And we, we discussed also that sometimes this pre preliminary phase is perhaps not um, considered um, to be as important, but it should be because this is where um, uh, really important um, objectives or the objectives are defined uh, that are realistic and and adapted to the to the to the current situation in that area. Um, and sorry, this is all uh, in the to do list of the FFPO business incubation staff. So that incubation unit, when trying to implement MND or wanting to implement MND, needs to also conduct some important surveys. Um, of the region, but also at a na national level, and importantly, also be very careful in the selection of field facilitators because they play a very crucial role in the implementation of MAND. And we also talked about the things that field facilitators need to do before MAND is being is started. So they need to really have a very good understanding of the 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 MAND methods and tools. Um, and they need to also uh, assess whether the conditions for the implementation of MAND are suitable locally. Uh, they need to have a good understanding of the local context and also prepare the, the tools that they're going to use with the entrepreneurs and adapt them to, to the local conditions and, and to the capacities and, and language requirements of, of their trainees. <clears throat> So then we talked about the objectives of phase one, and we said that this is the moment where um, the potential entrepreneurs 
identify themselves and uh, and um, um, reflect and express what their expectations are, um, especially financial expectations. They will also develop a first understanding of the, the available resources and products. And they will start to gather information around the opportunities and constraints within the existing value chains and market systems. And um, I've put together a, a short slide just to sort of summarize a little bit some of the points that we, we have discussed in the various um, moments when we had conversations and discussions. And I uh, wanted to also make the link to some of the the, the issues that you may, may have raised in the pre-training survey. Um, so um, I just wanted to emphasize again that many problems listed in this pre-training survey can actually be avoided by being careful and active in the preliminary phase. And it's really crucial that you consider your objectives um, and that where MAND is implemented, there are enough funds and resources to achieve those objectives. So you also need to consider about the number of people you want to implicate, for example. Um, and in some cases um, where the conditions are not right, there needs to be also the courage to say, actually, this is not a condition where it can be implemented. So then you know, need to also take that decision. Um, I also wanted to emphasize again that it really takes time to build up the confidence of entrepreneurs and this goes back again to the the resources that you invest in the process and to allow people to really absorb what they learn and implement and 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 try and test things and build up their confidence over time and this needs patience um I also wanted to say that it's crucial that in this preliminary phase, the project or the FFPO business incubation unit um, gathers information on the market potential for a range of products. So really be open in this first assessment and not um, restrict yourselves to, to one type of product. Um, and sometimes local people are only aware, aware of a few products or they might be pushed to only consider one or two types of products, but the facilitators should really encourage them to consider a wide range of products. Um, then I also wanted to talk here, I've written MAND as a process, not as a goal, that um, it's really important that MAND is considered as, um, so the objective of implementing MAND um, the objective is not to implement MAND no matter what. Um, the objective is to support interested and entrepreneurial minded local producers to develop their own sustainable businesses. So a top down selection of participants and setting boundaries around what these people should focus their activities on is really quite counterproductive and should be avoided. Um, and then we also talked about groups and I'm very happy that um, Johnny and uh, Sophie can join us and that we also have a few of the FFF facilitators because this is a discussion that we wanted to have with all of you. Um, so just on, in terms of groups, um, we said that it's, it's, it's good to encourage people to decide for themselves if they want to um, set up their enterprise as part of a group or if they want to set up a small individual business, which is also possible and can be sustained and can work well. And I think it was Isabel who mentioned yesterday that sometimes when you have a pre-existing groups um, and there is this idea to develop a business together, you have to be careful on how you, how you go about this because maybe not everyone in the group is capable of being part of an enterprise, wants to be part of an enterprise. Um, and I just wanted to touch here also on on one particular aspect that we saw in some of the EDPs in that um, sometimes there is some confusion, um, EDP and uh, enterprise development plans. So sometimes there seems to be a confusion about um, how a new business sits within an FFPO, a forest and farm producer organization or a producer group. So there are some questions there around 
whose resources the business is based on, who will run the business, who is actually the business, who will profit from the business. So things that need to be clarified. And I just, I'm going to stop sharing now because I'm really interested to hear about your experiences in this as producer organizations um, or members of producer organizations and 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 business development in that context. Um, is do you, is there someone who would like to maybe recount their experience and how how this how this works well or maybe where there could be difficulties where you face challenges in setting up a business from within a group? Hi, hi Kata. Um, yes, this is Mark. Please. Joining from Ghana, first of all, apologies for our absence yesterday. Um, a number of us are here in Accra um, towards our national dialogue. And uh, today we have about five of us who have joined. And uh, I must say, I think about two of us have had uh, some MAND training, myself and Clifford, in the past. And I really, um, it sits well with me when you said um, we need to be able to choose, Gene, whether you want to set up an enterprise as a group or individuals also setting up small businesses around what they can do. Um, and I think that is very, very useful, especially for us uh, in working with small uh, producer organizations. There comes a time where probably some individuals also want to set up certain businesses around um, the enterprises that they want to focus on. And there's a need to be able to do a clear distinction between what you are doing as a group and um, individuals in terms of what they want to do in terms of their businesses. And so I really agree with you. We need to be able to identify such cases and be able to apply um, the process in both cases, that is for groups and also in terms of individuals, in terms of how they want to apply their uh, business plans. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Yes, yes, that's a very, a very good recapping of, um, of the importance of making sure that both structures um, receive attention or both both strategies receive attention. I could see Clifford's, Clifford's hand and then Geoffrey, please. Okay, um, uh, this is Clifford from Ghana. Uh, apologies just to join to what Mark already uh, said. Uh, with uh, groups and individual businesses. I think uh, as a facilitator, we actually need to uh, be able to understand the context or the cultural dynamics of the various uh, uh, groups that we are facilitating. There are instances where we go with the assumption that we want to facilitate a group enterprise, and then you end up setting up the enterprise and then the groups are not actually running the enterprise. We have had instances where we set up uh, enterprises as groups, and then subsequently we realized that uh, the groups are not really committed to uh, running the enterprise uh, based on internal issues, because some people feel they have not been uh, uh, directly part of the process, and some other feel that there is a hijack by individuals within the group, and sometimes there is that conflict uh, that comes with uh, running these group enterprises. So we have in the past considered even to the extent that we thought it was important to privatize some of those enterprises, especially those that had to do with uh, 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 running of uh, corn mills. We thought of uh, bringing on board individuals who are private entrepreneurs to run it, and then the groups probably would take what uh, what do you call it, rental fees. So uh, the private person will uh, will have to look at uh, paying either annually or monthly for the usage of the facility of the group, so that the groups are only receiving returns from what the private person is paying. In that case, you need to also have a benefit sharing mechanism that is clear enough to, and to make people feel comfortable that whatever revenues is going to be accrued to that particular enterprises, this is going to be the process for sharing the benefits that is accrued to it. So once you have those benefit sharing schemes also well developed and established, 
uh, then you are good to go. So like you said, yes, we need to actually look at how to manage group enterprises and also how to facilitate individuals. Uh, and I, there was one important point you raised earlier, which you are looking at uh, the setting up enterprises and identifying a wide range of products. In the past, we just limited to one product, which was really a bit uh, difficult because FFPOs are engaged in many different products. So if you limit it to one product, what happens to the other products? So I think that point also you made was very, very important for me. And I think, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Clifford. Some really interesting points you've raised there. And I, I'd be really interested also to hear about other examples of how you've you've um, you've managed to to find a solution for this problem where a group might not be ready to run a business as a group. Um, and Clifford gave us an example of how they've set up these cornmeal rental arrangements. Uh, Geoffrey's hand was up, please. Uh, thanks, Kata. Um, I think my, my, my question or comment is also related to what Clifford has just said. And it's about uh, where you have a group uh, and, and these group members have uh, conflicting needs in terms of the enterprise you, are, you want to set up. And I think in that way, now it is the role of the facilitator to help them to understand or maybe do some kind of ranking of the products so that maybe they can agree or, or pick the, the best or the most profitable in terms of, uh, of the market. So I think in that case, and then it is the role of the facilitator to help the uh, the, the group members to understand. And, and again, I think the other, the other thing which Clifford has said is about the benefit sharing. And a good example is uh, in one of the athletes that we are working with, we have a group nursery. And, and two months ago, uh, we went there with my colleague who is also in this meeting, uh, Edwin, I mean, in this training. And I think there was this lady who was openly complaining about, uh, you know, she was saying she spends the most hours on in the nursery, and, 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 and so in terms of the benefit, she thinks she, you know, she needs to be uh, considered you know, more than the others. Uh, I, and I think this, her concerns were very genuine because now she's, she, she's doing most of the, uh, she's spending most of her time in the nursery, but when it comes to sharing benefits, the other members also want to, to, to benefit. So, so the issue of the joy riders also in the group, uh, which I think uh, is also very, uh, very important to consider. Then, then my my last uh, my last point is about uh, when you are considering a, a products like a, a range of products. So would would that be as a strategy to 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 de risk the the enterprise in terms of like you have if if one enterprise fails, then you have you know you, like you have a fallback plan or. It can also be like you are trying to create uh, multiple income streams. So, so the issue of uh, like, like wh why should it be important to consider a wide range of products? Yes, uh, thank you, Geoffrey. Um, just on your last question, uh, this is my understanding also that, and the two points though, the two reasons you've raised are actually closely re related. Um, so to have multiple income, scre income streams also means that you're de-risking um, your 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 enterprise um but it's i think it's also about making use of the resources that are available to you and finding perhaps um niche markets and uh for products that are perhaps not not considered by everyone um but uh, maybe also isabel and 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 Jacques would like to come in on that yeah um yeah, this is a very key point, actually. And it's it's a, a key point uh, which has to be considered, especially in, in, in phase two. Uh, why it's interesting to have a, a range of different products is also uh, in order to respect the social uh, nature of the group. You may have uh, in the group or uh, formal or informal, different type of uh, potential entrepreneurs who have different needs. And Clifford actually mentioned that. And you may have uh, women 
who, are, who have some uh, limited time or who cannot go find the forest, or etc., etc. You may have also elders or a very dynamic, young, uh, entrepreneur-minded people. And we should try to, as a facilitator, we should try to uh, see all the different possibilities uh, who could fill the needs of this type of people. And, and, and that, that means also different range of different products uh, that will require uh, more or less time, more or less uh, investment, more or less uh, education. And this actually uh, oh, should, this is should be is very important to, to, uh, to respect. And that's why a different range of products is important. And some, uh, at, at the end of, of, of phase two, when you uh, rank this uh, product, you can see that you have four or five uh, different products who have good, good, good results. So, and it will be the, the entrepreneurs themselves who will choose what fits them or because they have a long experience on some of them, or because it's closer to their house, or whatever. And uh, so that's why I think it's, it's, a, it's a key point to not reduce the range of product so that it can fit the needs of different types of potential entrepreneurs within the group or as individuals or as a group. Thank you, Isabel. Then I could see Yao's hand up from Togo. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yao from uh, a Farmers Organization from Togo. I had a question, but with uh, the intervention from Isabel, I uh, got part of the response. It was about the number of products to consider. Is there uh, an average number of products to consider? Uh, before her uh, intervention, uh, before she took the floor, I understood that we need to talk, talk about or uh, consider about four or five products, uh, taking into account uh, the environment or the area. So if uh, there are no other products in the area, what should we do? Do we impose them? Please, Isabel. Can I answer that question? Yes. English, but you have the translation. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I, it will be uh, actually depending on the on the specific condition of the site and of the people of, of the site, because there are natural conditions that uh, are in some in some uh, context you will have a lot of different products and a lot of different products. Could, could be derived from the actual resources in the site. That means, for example, from bamboo or rattan, you, you may have uh, four or five type of products that come up. That means you can have furniture, you can have poles for, uh, for constructing houses, etc., etc. and these become products. So from two or three resources, you may end up with five or six products which will have to be considered as different products. And in some other context, because of the, of the natural condition, you may have only two or three resources and products. So it will really depend on, on the context of, of, the, of the local entrepreneur's natural context, and also of the, the other factors that we have to consider in, during the analysis, uh, including the market aspect, the, the, the communication transport aspect. So when this analysis has done in uh, more details in, in phase two, uh, you may end up with only two or three products and that's fine, uh, but you may also end up with much more. So it will really depend on, on, on the situation. And it is that that the, the, the facilitator should actually understand, huh? uh, but, but never restrict uh, what, what we are actually uh, pointing is that uh, in some cases, uh, all the government or whatever, they already have selected on the bracket 
a type of product that they would like the, a lot of people to develop. And there is kind of pressure to influence people to develop it. And we, through m and we say, okay, it may be one very good product included in the, in the uh, selection, but this, the development of this product may not fit to the needs of all the potential entrepreneurs in that of your target group. And if so, you can also see what else is there on top of this uh, uh, push product that could be developed and fit the need of some others. That's, that's what I mean. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Please, Jack. Can, okay. Please. So for, for me, the concept is that we, we speak start up, to select an area with a certain number of people in this area. The idea is that we have to help these people to develop their business or to have an idea of business. So we go to different steps and they select a certain number of products. They go to the market and they decide what is the best product for them. Then after that, when they do their business plan, they realize, okay, I can do this alone or I have to do this with others. So at that time, if they have to do this with others, they make some type of group or a structure of an organization that can okay, fit with their needs. I don't know if I am clear. So if we, I will give you some example. I've been working in Malawi and there were different range of products. And we end up with some people who have done just a small product like a who handle, you know, to go in the field. They prepare handle for the who, for the villager to go and to plow in the forest. And this guy has done his own job by himself and he was very happy. He earned enough money for his life and he was really, very really happy. And there were some other people who decided to make firewood. But they collect the firewood on their own, but they decide, they saw that to transport the firewood from one place to another place, that was very important because they had better market, then they had to organize. That organized at the beginning on an informal group. And finally, they formalized this as a cooperative. So all this idea of making group or not group or something like this, or selecting a product or not selecting a product, that has to be done by the villager himself, or we can say the people who are interested to select business. They have to select the business after their wish. I think they feel happy with, okay? Not as some other be happy and push them to do something. That is the first thing. And then after that, they have to see if to do their business, they can do this alone or they have to be with others. Then at that time, if they have to be with others, I repeat myself, so I'm sorry. If they have to do this with others, then at that time, they make some type of enterprise formal enterprise, cooperative, or whatever you want. I don't know if I am this clear. Yes, thank you, Jacques. Um, I just wanted to quickly, um, before I ask Tang to, to unmute himself, I just wanted to quickly comment that it is, of course, a, a complexity where um, we support forest and farm producer organizations, and we support um, capacity development in all sorts of different areas, including business development. And so there is going to be always a sort of um, an entry point with producer groups. And I think there is something that perhaps we need to also look at as the FFF in, in, in creating capacity development in how to manage um, an MAND process with an existing group. And I, I have something to share um, at the end of this discussion where um, there is actually a really good tool in the last tool of the forest, uh, sorry, of the field facilitator guideline for phase two contains a list of good practices for groups. And I think some of the things that uh, Mark and uh, Clifford and Geoffrey have touched upon in terms of issues in, in, in groups can be avoided by looking at these 
these good management practices. Um, and I can share that a bit later, but I just wanted to give the word to uh, Tang now, please. Thank you, Kata. Good uh, afternoon uh, from Vietnam to everyone. I am Tang from MMF uh, Vietnam. Yes, uh, uh, MAND is a um, very interesting tool as we discussed uh, since uh, yesterday. Uh, to come back with uh, Kata's uh, questions raised for discussion, uh, I think um, for Vietnam, we have some uh, FBOs uh, who very successfully applied uh, MND uh, approach. But uh, for the remaining, they still uh, facing many difficulties. So uh, because of uh, Kata's question regarding to the challenge and difficulty uh, in uh, supporting MFPLs to implement uh, uh, MAND. Uh, I think uh, the first thing we uh, we face and uh, we, we we meet the challenge when supporting and uh, convince uh, uh, MFPLs to apply uh, MAND is uh, because uh, MAND is uh, a tool with a long process. You know, at first, uh, we invite uh, many NFPOs to join and even their members to join. But uh, because of a long process, it takes time to understand NFPOs, their product, their situation, and we have to analyze very well and understand very well the MAND. If not, uh, not only uh, we, we can only uh, identify potential and and three trainers only not uh, in, in a group. That what we what we have uh, learned and we spend a lot of time to convince and support the uh, NFPOs in working in a group. And the second uh, thing I uh, we think that uh, very challenge for the NFPOs when they they uh, make uh, a plan and doing business is that. Uh, to understand very well the five areas of uh, business development, understand very well and identify uh, their situation. Uh, regarding this, I would like to share one experience of uh, plywood uh, timber processing. You know, we, sub uh, we support them, teach, teach them, and bring uh, brought them to the market to, to see the potential of the back market. And after that, they uh, came back uh, their uh, group to establish a plywood uh, processing factory. Everything is set. And uh, they already identified the uh, timber, plywood timber is the potential. So they focus on doing business. Everything is uh, prepared. But when they uh, started, you know that uh, the electric city, they, they did not uh, foresee for, for that. So when they really wanted to start, but uh, there's no electricity because uh, in order to run the operation of the plywood uh, machinery, they have to assess with very high voltage electric electricity. And sorry, Tom, you're breaking up every now and then. Could you speak up a little bit? Excuse me. Would you mind speaking a little bit louder, please? Ah, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, to see to see uh, share experience uh, how to uh, support MFPOs to uh, assess with uh, legal status. So they, they they thought they can assess the electricity, but uh, uh, at the, the end they could not. So at that time, uh, BNW and MFT we had to work with uh, different related uh, uh, agency to uh, help them to assess the electricity electricity, for example, local authority and uh, department of uh, planning and development at district level. And so why they can, cannot uh, assess with electricity and which document can you please show? So after that, uh, luckily, finally, they can assess the uh, electricity for their production. Thank you. Thank you, Tang. Thank you for um, also for highlighting um, the need to be patient with MAND and to, to, to allow it enough time for entrepreneurs to really build up their confidence and their capacities and understanding their own situation and their own possibilities. Um, I would like to give the floor to Sophie. 
Yeah, hi, uh, thank you. Um, this is a very interesting discussion about the group and the individual uh, dichotomy <laughs> that we see in MENDU. We see in FFF, uh, when we work with groups, you have individual, what we have seen in the reality when we work with FFPOs in the different countries, you have individuals coming together for something, no? They come together for, uh, because uh, for social, for economic reasons, they form a group. And that's, uh, and they, and so they are coming. Uh, and so based on that, you can then work with them also on a business. But you have also, we also have situations where we work with groups. Our entry point are the groups, are the community forest user groups, no? Or the groups that are working in, in the landscapes, uh, with collective tenure. So the tenure is a really important uh, entry point, I think also that we have to consider when we just, because that that also um, influenced the business and the motivation also, I have to say in, in, in the end of the day. So we have seen that, that um, Often it's easier, maybe I don't know when in, when you have individuals who have tenure, a little plots of land, they see, oh, we need um, in fact, we are we are, and that's what we have been using, for instance, in Vietnam, you are all individual smallholder tree growers. In fact, if you come together, there is something more to get out of it, uh, ec economies of scale, so you come together and there is this motivation to get a business together. Now, if you have those situations where you have collective land and you can pick out there the, uh, uh, like the community forest, uh, com community forests where we are working and there, uh, not everybody in this community forest, not all these uh, users are part of the business. So you have a little bit of an issue there. How? Those, how are you going to um, to do the? Uh, how are you going to pay for these natural resources that come from this collective forest, and you are only with three people doing your business? So, what kind of model are we going to set in, in place? Are we are struggling with this every every time, no? Because it is, it is, uh, it's the entry point that is really is really. Uh, I, I at the end of the day, I think is is. Uh, is uh, important and like with the collective uh, land, the community forest, at a certain point also, you have the mix because people say, oh, we cannot have enough produce in the, co in, 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 the, in the forest. Let's now start to also include in the business our private land. And then it becomes even more com complex. So I just want to say, this is one of these, um, these entry points that, that are making our work uh, and as facilitators not so easy. And, and then also what are the right business models for these kind of situations? Is it cooperatives? Uh, because cooperatives, okay, this is the, the, the model that speaks to the collective uh, goods, but that's not always maybe the, the right way either. So I'm just having more questions sometimes. <laughs> but I just want, I think this is very important to do this analysis also, where are we starting from where, from the natural resources that we use for our businesses? Oh, if they're really collected, yes or not. If they are produced, they are domesticated, are they in the in our back garden? Are they actually produced as agriculture produce? So that makes also, uh, that is also, these are also factors that are influencing a lot of our business model. So Kata, I don't have all the answers <laughs> yet. <laughs> okay, but I think this is a really, a really good discussion. Session. I'm really glad that we're all together and we're actually behind schedule in my program, but I just think this is a really important point to discuss also while we have um, Johnny and Sophie with us. Um, I guess one of the one of the observations as someone who's relatively new to FFF and and to the idea of group businesses is from hearing about your experiences that um, transparency, um, right from the 
start is perhaps the most important tool to to sort this out to to um to really as uh, Sophie said to be clear about whose resources is the enterprise based on who is going to take decisions uh, who is going to benefit and how and so clarity and transparency in how things are set up but then also being adaptable and having a process included right from the start where you can review your operations and review how happy people are with the setup um, to avoid situations where you start off as a group and then somehow it's not really working because some people feel cheated. Um, so you need to also have a process right from the start where you review regularly whether this is still working for everyone and then adapt to the situation. Um, I don't know whether this is... Um, a valid point. I was just wondering whether Johnny had um, any comments or inputs or perhaps some experiences he would like to share. And then perhaps I would just like to share my slide and then move on to our main agenda. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Kata. And, um, thank you, uh, Isabel and Jacques, for organizing this meeting. I appreciate that um, many of our facilitators are here and also the umbrella organizations in the countries that we support. To me, it's very important that uh, the FFF will support the um, service provision of these umbrella organizations to their members on this business if they want. So that is important. If these umbrella organizations have the capacities to provide these services, because most of the challenges of all the um, apex organizations is this lacking of funding to do to be sustainable. They are depending on donors um, very much or other sources, and the one of the key ways for the sustainability is service that the members appreciate that. And of course, this business um, possibility would be a very good source of, of funding to the uh, umbrella organizations if do that in a uh, way that the members appreciate. Therefore, we like this idea about this business wing in the umbrella organization so it's important also that not the person who talks well is, is good in business. So, and also I don't think that there is a model for each country, but I really appreciate that in the countries I work with, there are some different ways of, of uh, growing this business wing and uh, would be uh, really good that as a result of this uh, training, that this umbrella organization, the organization think on how they will grow this um, business wing. And I will um, finalize saying that is um, a challenge because business incubation, and as, as you see also this MAD process is a long process need a lot of time and funding investment, which FFF itself could not provide. It's really needed that the producer organization believe on it and so use a lot of imagination because at the end of the training, we will not say, okay, do that because the FFF will provide you all the money that you need. That is not the case. Only the people who want to do will do that. And we are ready to accompany you if you believe that it is useful for you and the members that you serve. Thank you and over. Thank you, Johnny. Um, actually, that's something that we discussed also in Tanzania um, with some of the, the, the produce organizations, the sort of regional produce organizations. And it sort of adds a layer of complexity because now we're talking about um, these umbrella organizations running a business um, themselves um, and uh, through this generating funds in order to uh, also 
be able to provide additional services to their members. So this is really a business at a high level. And, and yes, it is probably a really good idea for this unit, this business unit, to run an MA and D type of process to understand um, how to set this up. Um, and I think what we talked about previously is um, the sort of local producer groups and those people trying to set up an uh, um, an enterprise that allows them to not only sell their products um, but to really market them and to 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 understand their 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 um, their situation within the market and their potential to 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 function as enterprises. Um, so that's there. I think there there's slightly different things and slightly different levels. Um, and M A N D could be a really useful tool in both of those situations. Um, and perhaps also by an umbrella organization running a business and therefore generating some profit, one of the services which they could then afford um, to to their members is, for example, providing. M A and D capacity building, so that the producer groups that supply the products to this business unit could perhaps also improve and value add and and sort of move up um, in 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 their profits and their their market position. I don't know whether this makes sense. Um, <laughs> I'm, I guess we're all struggling with this. It's it's very complex, um, but I'm glad we we had this conversation. Um, unless there are any pressing uh, questions or issues that we still want to talk about around group businesses, I would now like to move to our agenda because we're really behind schedule. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, great. Yep. Um, so then um, let me rejig everything here because I've um, moved around in my slides. One second. Okay, let me start sharing again. Sorry, it's all a process. Okay. Uh, no, that's not this, this one. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Um, okay, let me go back to my notes then and we can start. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to talk about the second phase of MA and D. And um, I, I wanted to have a quick discussion around what the objectives are, but I think we're a bit short on time. So I'm just going to skip that discussion now, if you allow me, and um, just tell you that what you probably already know that phase two really aims um, to help potential entrepreneurs um, select their the best products and enterprise options and to collect all the information required to design their enterprise development plan, which then happens in phase three. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to move forward. Um, so you can see here again the filter diagram and you all know this probably by heart now, but we're in phase two where we have pre-selected some products um, from phase one and then the entrepreneurs assess um, the, the opportunities and constraints in all of the five areas of enterprise development until they select one final product. And um, there is something um, to be said about, sorry, let me skip. So uh, these are, yeah, so we've talked about the different um, uh, objectives of phase two. So the entrepreneurs in step one collect the data on the five areas of enterprise development. And then in step two, they select the most promising products. And in step three, um, the entrepreneurs reflect on the most appropriate form of enterprises. Um, so I just wanted to very quickly mention that in the transition from phase one and phase two, um, it's a good idea to not let too much time pass between the 
the faces to maintain momentum and, and interest. And it's a good idea to organize a workshop with those entrepreneurs who are still interested in, in going down the MAND path and developing enterprises. And in this workshop, you could discuss um, uh, you could discuss um, have a discussion around the products and the justification for their pre-selection. Um, you could also discuss what went well, or what was easy, or difficult, what was wrong, how would you do, do things differently. And this, I think, is important to, to maintain or create ownership of the process, but also to correct the course if major obstacles came up or if you feel that there are some misunderstandings around um, the principles and the process of MAND. <clears throat> so now I would like to talk with you about step one of phase two. And uh, here I would like to um, stop sharing. And I would like to ask you, one of you, to perhaps recount and tell us the story of how you implemented this first step, this first step of phase two, where the entrepreneurs collect data on the five areas of enterprise development. Development. And in particular, we're interested to hear whether you've encountered challenges um, and how perhaps you went about solving those. So the floor is yours. Is someone perhaps willing to volunteer and tell us about their experiences in implementing this first step of phase two? Or perhaps tell us of any questions or issues they have encountered and would like to discuss with us all or if someone could perhaps think of any issues that might come up may i have some ideas yes please uh, yes, yes. Mm. i think the from the first uh, first step to the step two of phase two of mand very important after we make the assessment and uh, among the potential product uh, we choose the uh, most potential, yes, from uh, uh, the uh, area and uh, how the five uh, factor will affect to their business is very important. And um, I think uh, through the FFF in Vietnam, we have some uh, experience and, and some less learned. Uh, we start well with the FFF uh, from uh, 2019, yes, and after one year, 2020, we have the pandemic, and uh, some our FFP uh, uh, faced with many difficulty of um, first is the uh, uh, market broken. And the second, the, the price of uh, feeding of chicken very high increase some mfo they raise the chicken under the forest they suffer with the uh, the market broken and the feeding of chicken very high cost for feeding chicken this is why when we suffer with some uh, uh, suddenly problem we not only concern about our potential product in in that area in even in the assessment we follow their group they have the timber they have the uh, medicine uh, tree or they also have the chicken under the forest and honey but we draw our lesson and we think that if we continue to develop the chicken raising with the very big volume, sometimes we suffer with the market uh, demand because the, the, the pandemic, the people do not cannot transfer the food from the province to the market easily. This is why the requirement from the customer also, also limited. And then we also advise our FAPO they can uh, move to some other work. Maybe in the, at the beginning, they did not see their potential. But when we draw our uh, our situation, if 
they fold that they can uh, have the the mushroom raising and they start with mushroom raising it means that they do not have to invest um, the the cost for input for mushroom raising and even when we transfer mushroom to the market sometimes the custom customer can get the mushroom immediately and very uh, very quickly done for chicken transfer because when we when we, when we work with our MPO, we think that the pandemic uh, very very challenging if we only uh, based on our uh, the 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 old uh, business planning sometimes we have a very high risk this is why i think that the, after we learn uh, risk management uh, supported by IAED in Nepal. We also come back and we train our FAPO and this is very, very useful and very important for our FAPO, including the MAND, but we, we think that now the market chain very quickly and how we can uh, avoid uh, some challenges from the market changing is it, very important also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Yes, and it sort of reiterates also the, the need to move quite quickly between uh, phase one and phase two, because if the situation allows, of course, and we don't have a global pandemic, because the situation can change and um, and some of the some of the products that are you have pre-selected um, will not no longer be viable. And of course, this will come out in phase two as you assess in more in-depth um the situation for each product um i was wondering whether um isabel or jacques had anything else to add to that um just one point what what uh, i think was very important in in uh, one uh, uh, intervention is that yes uh it's not because we have done a, a careful uh, research and, and, and prepared the EDP carefully that it, it's it's good for for five years. It is it is clear that uh, the enterprise every year will have to come back on the results of the previous year and and, and review the EDP accordingly according to uh, internal factor. Do they face any internal? problems or positive aspects doing better than expected and also external factors like you mentioned and that's where the risk management uh, uh, strategy will be very important um, so, so that, that's all what I have to add I mean yes regular review of the EDP uh, let's say changing the product or evolving uh, have, have a product that which evolved to something else, but with the same resource could be also a possibility. And, and yes, the regular review, it's, it's very important. Thank you, Isabel. Marc, please. Thank you very much, um, Kata. And um, I just wanted to emphasize, especially the fact of, um, especially the first step in phase two, um, which is the data collection that you need to be able to have to be able to inform what you do in phase three, which is uh, developing the enterprise development plan. And I want to emphasize that using just two um, of the five areas of enterprise development, uh, including the environment and environmental sustainability, which is very, very important to consider, especially in terms of the product that you are going to be dealing with. So for instance, if you are dealing with a group that wants to go into honey, the environmental conditions that are available within the landscape need to be uh, supportive of any production and then of course another element is also the market and market potential and that's why you need to do the market surveys to be able to understand the extent to which your product would definitely have a market availability so in considering same i think that phase two is a very important aspect in terms of how you um, accompany forest producers to be able to identify which particular product has a, a very higher uh, market potential in terms of uh, what they want to do and of course also in terms of the environment in which they find themselves is the environment able to sustain that business and as Isabel said I think the risk management factors 
need to be looked at very carefully. And also the fact that it is not just a one-off situation, you need to be able to uh, go back to the EDP and review it every other year because the market conditions change and the environmental conditions also change within the landscape that you work in. And so there's a need to usually consider uh, these, especially two aspects in terms of how you um, are, um, are affecting uh, how enterprise entrepreneurs are being able to identify which products are best suited for their uh, environments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Yes, indeed. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, I mean, the market uh, chain analysis is the very first step in your data collection. And we're going to talk about this. Um, or I'm going to um, show this also in the slides. But then there are also all the other areas that need to be considered, including the environment. Importantly, and you're right to emphasize that um, this is a very important um important area to consider and but of course also the others so the social context the the technical issues the the, the legal context um, all of those need to be for all of those areas data needs to be collected um also in the second phase as was already done in the first phase but in the second phase this is a more in-depth and more more structured data collection um is there anyone else who would like to perhaps I hear someone's mic open. Um, perhaps you would like to speak. <laughs> I don't know who that is. I can't see. Sorry. Tuan, please. I think the first step uh, when we conduct uh, in apply MND in Vietnam, we uh, um, like uh, even uh, success be above. Uh, in my point of view, we also have uh, other other difficult, like um, um, beside uh, beside farmer uh, do not get uh, critical information for their business, uh, but also they don't know how to collect them because the, before they didn't uh, do it. Uh, and uh, and uh, another difficult is uh, in the process of getting gathering information, uh, supply chain experts do not want to share information with farmers because uh, they uh, they feel uh, um, uh, they they don't have a free time and they don't want to share um, secret uh, related to uh, their marketing uh, and. Um, uh, to to have uh, FFPO, we we need to we we mobile mobilize notice from this link relationship with local officer, so they uh, they have to support. For example, um, Mr. Quang is a leader of um, farmer farmer province of um, uh, Bắc Cạn. So he, he will collect with uh, one actor that he have a relationship with him to success to help the farmer yeah so i i think that's also very difficult for for, for FFPO as a first step when when they conduct or, or apply mnd to collect uh, information about mar marketing yeah i think that's all thank you Tuan. Yeah. it's really interesting and uh, i i would like to comment on one aspect you've raised and then perhaps also ask Isabel and Jack to, to come in, and especially on um, the, the problems around um, certain actors not willing, um, not being willing to share information. Um, but I just wanted to talk about the point you've raised about farmers not being used to collecting data. Um, and, and that's I mean, that is one of the main reasons why MAND Toolkit was developed, because it has some really good tools that um, facilitators can use in, in enabling farmers to learn these skills and to, to build their confidence. Um, and But again, I, it comes back to giving enough time and, and adapting the, the toolkit to, to the local condition. Um, um, but it, it it provides a very structured way of actually allowing people to to collect data in a way that they were not used to do before. And I think this is the real magic of MAND that it really gives you 
it really gives entrepreneurs this power to to understand their environment better. Um, uh, can I pass the the floor to Isabella or Jacques um, on the on the problems with people not sharing information? Yeah. Um, so of course, the the, the point point of uh, do we get reliable information that we need is a key question. But, uh, and I think maybe this point is underestimated by the facilitators. Uh, the facilitators themselves, they need to be trained or to train themselves in uh, how to get information. The list of, in, of information to get, I mean, in the in the in the field facilitator guidelines, I think it's quite clear in the five areas, the are checklist, it's not so complicated. But how do we get this information when you have never been there to, to, to collect information? So there is it's a training in itself. And there are some tricks to avoid. There are some tools to apply, like triangulation to ask to few people. You know that people will lie a little bit. So you ask to several sources, etc. cetera. Uh, and you have also to, to, to see that you are uh, different levels of information. You, if you have local people who, have, who are not educated, who don't used to go very far from their home, you will know as a facilitator or as a, a team uh, who, who manage the, the uh, application of MAND that they, they can get information to a certain extent. They can get information from informants in, let's say, in, in the commune or in the district, etc. But you know that they will need also some information that are actually uh, existing elsewhere. And they are not strong enough, they are not trained enough to get this information. So, uh, and, and that's where the, the project and the service that the, the, the incubation business could give is that to identify uh, someone who would go for them to get this information, someone, someone who, but uh, in, in close relation with them. That means deciding with them what information has to be uh, collected and to, to explain them which, who, who will be the informants they will, they will contact and also to uh, uh, go back to them and explain all the, the, the information they got. So it, it is, we cannot say to the, to the um, local people, okay, there is this list of information, uh, organize yourself to go and, 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 and collect them. Facilitator has to be trained. A facilitator has to be there for the first round of data collection. Once the, the, they have collected the first round of, of information, they feel how they should uh, behave. If you, those who have been in, in training uh, with, with us, we, you, you may remember that we had quite a long time discussion about this. Uh, how to collect information. Because if you don't get really good information, then the whole, whole thing will be affected. Mm. So yes, you, there is a support to be given to the facilitator and the facilitator to the local people for, for this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Isabella. I just perhaps wanted to... Maybe it's my turn. Yes, please, Jack. No, you just... Okay, in addition to what Isabel said, I think when we have the information, we, we try to collect the information, okay? So we, we have a certain number of time that we put to collect this information. Then at the end of this, we have a certain number of information that we have to analyze and we have to be clear. Either we can get farther than that, and get more information, or if we cannot get further than that, and we have to work with this information. So the second solution is that we cannot go further than that, we cannot get more information. Then at that time, we have to decide, can we make a business or not? Then if we don't have the information, we close the show, and we don't do the business, because villagers and facilitators are not able to find the good information to set up this business 
So there is too much risk and we don't do it. It's a question of getting the information, analyzing them, and see if we take a risk or not to do the business. Done. Thank you, Jacques. Um, yes, so just perhaps one more point I wanted to add on top. Um, and um, and I don't know how useful this is in your context, Juan, but um, if you perhaps find or if, if entrepreneurs or the data collectors among them find that um, one particular actor is not willing to, to disclose certain information, is there perhaps a possibility to go one step higher and and ask the the, the, the actors further up the value chain um, because then you can sort of deduct um, and understand what this person who is not willing to share information um, what their their sales volumes are and their prices um, it's just perhaps an additional tip um, I saw Clifford's hand up earlier but don't know whether he still wants to say something. Uh, no, I think I actually had planned that uh, most of the responses had actually covered what I wanted to say. But uh, on Isabel Isabella's uh, points, I think the facilitator, like she mentioned, is very, very critical in the process. Once the facilitator does not understand the process of gathering this data, it's really going to be a bit difficult to get the required data and to be able to run the analysis to be able to know what direction to go. Uh, so for me, I think in the process of uh, uh, going for the data collection, the tools to be used for this data collection must be jointly uh, developed with the enterprise group so that they also understand what goes into the tool. So in going also for the market surveys and all those things, you, the facilitator, don't have to step aside. You need to participate in the process. There are important questions that you also need to ask in the process of gathering the data, where you see that the, the, the group is leaving out some elements. You prompt them and say, okay, we need to inquire more about this and that. So, so it's, it's when the facilitator understands the process, it makes everything very easy for the data gathering uh, to be done. And we also need to pay attention to the fact that, yes, there are some people who naturally will not give out any information. They, they would either they give you wrong information or they would try to uh, not give you the information at all. In that case, what sometimes we do is, uh, let's say if it's about uh, issues of quantities and pricing, you can send informants into the market, like uh, 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 earlier said, to, 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 to observe the process over a period of, let's say, uh, two markets or three markets. Then based on those observations, they will be able to also give you information that will guide you in drawing your analysis and all that. So I think those things are very critical and that, uh, Disclosure issues are also going to be very uh, 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 problematic because some people naturally not give you information and you need to go a step higher to be able to get that information. That is very critical for your business uh, analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Clifford, for this really great summary um, of what we've just discussed. Um, Yvonne, did you want to come in again? Yeah, yes, I think as a... Uh, market information collection is a very important and very difficult, uh, especially for the timber productions. Why? Because uh, uh, through the, our FFS, at the beginning, when we start with the uh, uh, market information for timber, the almost the FFPO, they can know the price of their district, or some people can know about the uh, price of timber in province. But they cannot have the other information of other province or other enterprise in that um, uh, the, the, the value chain. This is why I so agree with Johnny. They said that the, the role of uh, APEC uh, organization and um, umbrella organization of farm are very important because uh, we have the wide connection with other APPO in other provinces. 
First, we have to use our networking of APEC organization, and we can uh, we can talk and we can deal with the other APEPO in other province, in other area, and we we also have the one channel to get information. This is the first thing, and second thing I think the APEC organization of farmer we have some specialists. They can work with some uh, specialists of forestry in the industry. This is uh, why we can connect with them and can know uh, more information from the timber production in the industry and some specialists. This is why when we organize the MAND, we also invite them to our training. They provide uh, maybe only one hour or two hours for the overall. Um, timber production and in even uh, information. They they have the some data and they have a very wide networking and relationship with other uh, timber production enterprise. This is the second channel. And the third thing when we organize, we also uh, use the opportunity to take our FAPO to visit some other um, enterprise. They, they do business in the timber production. And then FAPO representative can ask their member from other provinces and they get more information. And also they establish connection with each other. Through this the field trip, they, they make friends with each other and they can share information. Yeah, here in Bắc Cạn, we just have this pride, but in Bắc Giang and or Bắc Ninh or Quảng Ninh, they are so different other pride. Based on that, they have the farmer and farmer exchange information through our support. And we, we, we think that we also bring them to some enterprise for talking and for share information and provide what they have the volume of non timber production, for example, cinnamon. And through the four or five enterprise, they, 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 first they get the um, uh, introduction and they can make the friend and then they can express their uh, collaboration with enterprise, how they can supply the, the material for enterprise also in that value chain. And I, I think that we also bring them to our roundtable discussion. This means that the APEC organization and facilitator is the first step very important for uh, helping FAPO to get information in many options and many uh, chan uh, chan uh, um, opportunity. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you, Ivan. Yeah. I think this is a really, really important and interesting point. And of course, um, producers who are associated with producer organizations have this amazing advantage. Um, whereby these organizations can provide these important services to them and helping them acquiring information that they may not have access to normally. So that's a really, really Tato. good point. Thank you. Uh, Wahangi, did you want to come in? Wahangi, excuse me. Wahangi, excuse me. Wahangi, excuse me. Okay. Um, is there someone else who would perhaps like to... Um, one last last comment, one one last question before I move on to some slides. Any other issues that people have experienced in this first step of phase two? Okay, so then let me share my screen again. Yes, I can. I can hear nodding. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, so let's talk about data collection um, briefly. So step one in this process is, um, as we said, the market or value chain analysis to decide um, the best strategy to enter the value chain. Um, so market chain analysis is the first of several other areas um, around enterprise development that the entrepreneurs need to need to assess uh, need to do um, because without a market if if you find that in this first step there is no possibility for them to enter the market then all other data collection will be useless um, so this is the first point um, and um, 
just to talk a little bit more about the um, market data. So this is really um, a tool that entrepreneurs use to follow the product market chain from um, producer to consumer. And uh, you will, they will in this, um, in this setup, they will have to look at um, the prices of the products, um, the average quantities produced and traded, the transportation costs, any modifications to the product along the chain, um, and look at also competitors and some market trends for uh, for each. And they will have to do this for each actor, for each uh, actor involved in the chain. And it really helps for them to, to draw a market chain diagram to show all the main actors in the market, how they're related to, the, to each other and the role they each play. Um, so I'm very sorry that I, I could not squeeze the French translation of, of all of the text that is on the slide, but essentially it's a summary of what I've just said. So in this market data table that the entrepreneurs will, will compile, they will look at the, the actors, so who's involved, the different activities and quantities and, um, and qualities and the prices. And then they will also look at how. So they will look at payment arrangements, any means and duration of storage, um, any um, transformation or value adding of the product. And this market data table will allow the entrepreneurs to estimate the overall market size the level of competition, um, the cost implications, um, uh, so any requirements in terms of skill, equipment, etc., at each level. So uh, I just wanted to show, and again, I'm sorry, this is not translated in French, but it is the third tool in the second field facilitator guideline. Um, I just wanted to show um, that once the market chain has been analyzed, and there's some understanding that yes, there is an opportunity to enter this market with um, for particular products. Uh, the entrepreneurs will then also look at the different, the other areas of the around enterprise development. And it is important that they establish a list of criteria for each of the five areas. And they don't have to be very many, um, two to four criteria per area of enterprise development should be sufficient because the idea is not to, to, to create a, a very big um, database with perhaps information that might not be always useful, but to really get quality data on the, the key criteria that they've select for each for each area. And again, there are really helpful tools. So as I said, tool three in the film facilitator, the field facilitator guideline, and also tool four, which gives some, some, some ideas on what those criteria might be. Um, okay, so then um, if you find that there is limited capacity among your the entrepreneurs that you work with um, on how to collect data, you could include a session just to talk about this. So um, you could discuss different data collection methods. Um, and, oh, sorry. Um, and then I think it's important also um, that when data collection is being discussed by all of the entrepreneurs in the room, there is a discussion around um, the scope of the survey. So as I said, it's better to be selective and strategic. It's better to have a smaller amount of reliable information rather than large amounts of perhaps unreliable information. And then the entrepreneurs will need to um, select um, the key informants. So you need to also, they need to also discuss the criteria for how they select informants. informants. And uh, as Ivan also mentioned, it's really great if you can establish here strategic alliances perhaps with with um with other entrepreneurs or perhaps with transporters who are often key informants and could later on also become potential business partners um so in case where middlemen might not be very cooperative go to the next step as we have said um 
And then the, the different tools that will be used in the data collection have to keep, have to be gathered. So one of those is the market chain map that we've discussed in the market data table. Um, but then also the production and sales calendar. And I'm, I think you're all familiar with these because in the EDPs that you've sent us, this was included in most of them. Um, then also perhaps a production process map and um, where um, you could fill in how a, a particular product is transformed from step to step and what is needed for those transformations, for those value add additions. Um, and then they will have to develop um, a survey field plan and a schedule, and they need to identify the data collectors. Um, so um, ideally, those should be people who are quite active or perhaps already involved in producing, trading, um, or processing either one of those products, have the time um, to, to do this data collection and know how to take notes, are able to communicate back the data. Um, so that's quite an important task also to select the right collectors. And then as we've also said, it is um, it is really important for the facilitator to, to travel with the trainees and assist them when and where this is necessary. And there should be also from time to time a review um, to see whether there are any gaps or any information missing that needs to be perhaps added to the, to the plan um, in order to maximize survey outcomes. <clears throat> okay, I had a, um, a moment here on questions, but perhaps I would skip that and uh, for us to have some time in the end, perhaps if you have some questions on what I've just presented. Uh, and now I'd like to move to step two um, of phase two, um, which is the step where the potential entrepreneurs select the most promising products. And here I'm going to stop sharing again because I would like to hear about your um, experiences in implementing step two of phase two. So the, the, the data collectors have come back with their data and, and now what happens? Good morning, everyone. So following the data collection process. So what we did was to come up with a write-up so that we can select the most promising product so that we can continue uh, with the analysis. And therefore, at our level, most our, of our producers are the farmers who uh, deal with uh, uh, especially, you know, foodstuffs, food products. So therefore, there was a lot of data uh, that they uh, collected in the market. That means they were not expecting at all, they were not expecting uh, at all that their product uh, would be uh, will not be very uh, competitive uh, with regard to the markets that uh, they visited. So we had to re, um, uh, re reorganize their choice of uh, product so that they can, you know, uh, bring out um, uh, value add. It was a bit difficult because the intellectual level of our uh, FFPOs was very low. So at every time we were forced to, uh, you know, start afresh from the beginning and re-explain what are the stakes, what are the objectives to achieve in order for us to, you know, uh, put in place a, a, a real uh, sustainable evidence, you know, enterprise, sorry. So to date, it is very difficult to make them, you know, adopt a product uh, that will allow them really to get emancipated in the in the field. So for us in Madagascar, the um, uh, platform of uh, uh, women in secu food security, we are really at the beginning of the 
process, it is really difficult to train them on the uh, basic prince principles of the M, A, and D. So yeah, this is what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Wahangi. That's very, very interesting. Um, and of course, it's uh, it's great to have these tools available. Um, but uh, it's uh, it's always important also to see what are the local capacities and and how can we adjust our strategies and and it's great that you say that you've repeatedly and um, patiently worked with the with the producers to to explain where there were perhaps things not very clear. Um, is there perhaps someone else in the group who had similar experiences and who's maybe found? Uh, um, a good solution or perhaps other other issues that you may have encountered in this in the second step of 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 phase two and just i well, i would like to volunteer the vietnam team they had similar i when i hear the the the, the problems that uh, wahagi is saying I think in Vietnam, this was also very difficult in the beginning. I don't know if Tuang or Yvon or Tang can say something about that. Uh, Please, Team Vietnam, welcome. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Sophie. So that's the, and uh, I think Ms. Yvon and Mr. Tang will have a um, sub uh, opinion. And for me, I, I think, uh, in the two phase, in the two phase at the step two, uh, when we work with forest farmer, uh, um, uh, first time forest farmer always think that we, they um, only have a product is a wood, uh, and um, through learning and applying MND, farmer have to. Uh, reassess that timber is not the main product at the moment. And um, and they work together, follow their uh, FFBO to consider looking uh, for other potential. And they have to change their mind to think uh, maybe in the next year, they have to turn one of uh, the, uh, the, um, the uh, product to be uh, go to the market, um, and uh, at the same time, uh, because uh, how to turn turn on uh, um, uh, uh, on product to be uh, bring it to go to the market, they have to rethink about how to bring the product go to the market, and they have to working together first before thing to become uh, marketing uh, people. And they have uh, to working together, follow FFPO and strengthening advocacy for the local um, authorities interest and um, um, persuade them supporting uh, opening forestry roast or supporting the insta uh, installation of three-phase electricity to, to help them to turn one product to be a product for the market. Yeah. Um, that's my, yeah. Thank, thank you, you Tuan. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you also highlighting the, the role of the facilitator to, 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 open, to open up the window to other possibilities. Um, I think that's, that's really interesting and important. I can see Lydia's hand up. Welcome, please. Please, Lydia Miela from Ghana, we're listening. Yeah, good morning once again. Morning. I'm Lydia from Mataba. Uh, I want to thank you personally for the presentation. I'm learning a lot from it because yesterday or this week and last week, we have challenges. And when I look at uh, the informal data collection, it's very, very important that if I have started my project with it. It would have helped me because my women groups have planted onions. As I sit down now, we are looking for market for them, but we are not getting a good market. One woman has about 300 bags of onions. Yesterday, we don't have storage facilities. Where to keep them is a challenge. So I think that 
with these uh, tools that we are learning today, hence for the future, when we apply it, I think that to help our women, especially my women I'm working with who are widows and then teenage mothers. So I want to thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I, it sounds like this might be the first time you're, you're in an MAND training. Or have you, have you gone through training before? No, please. First time? Yes, please. Okay. So then um, I just perhaps would like to note that um, there is a much longer training um, which goes into much more detail for all the different phases of MAND. Um, and I mean, now we're sort of, this is a, a refresher training for people who have already uh, used it and have experienced some issues. And while there is some really interesting things, and I think you can pick up, I, I think it's, uh, I just wanted to also highlight that um, there is more. <laughs> and um, I don't know how we could, we could facilitate you to have access to that. But um, um, yes, I mean, if, if you're interested, there is a lot of material also online. If you have access, um, you can you can download. I don't know whether, Sophie, you could um, put in the chat, if you have a moment, um, the link to the to the tools so that Lydia can, can find them online. That would be wonderful. Um, otherwise, I will I will send them around after this after this um, session today. Um, please, I have, I, I can see the hand up of Agbe. Oh, uh, sorry, I just see Jean-Marc is back. Please, welcome Jean-Marc, floor is yours. Thank you for, well, uh, network is very bad. Mm. So after the training we had, we tried to share uh, the learnings with uh, other members of the group. So what we did, uh, on the ground with regard to the uh, ADM process was meant to improve production. The problem is that uh, people as uh, the Members education is very low and therefore it becomes a little bit difficult to uh, train them on the techniques. So we uh, taught them about the grazing techniques. So when you uh, look at the background, you can see maize growing that has been planted thanks to the techniques that we have taught the members. So we have done a promotion on maize growing thanks to the technique and we have also promoted beans growing and this was done thanks to the training that we uh, received uh, sorry, thank you, but uh, yes. yeah, it was very difficult to get yes. what he was saying. Yes, thank you so much, Jean-Marc. Um, it was it was a little bit difficult to hear exactly what you were what you were saying because the connection is unfortunately a little bit weak. Um, but I um, I think what I might have heard is that you have faced similar problems in terms of the capacities um, 
of the 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 producers in in working also with with the facilitator with the tools and and assessing their situation if i understood correctly um and um and i think you then talked about um the mice cultivation um and about improving quality of of the product but i'm not 100 percent certain um so I just wanted to sort of see whether those who have raised their hands already have some have some feedback on on how to deal with this problem of very low capacities of of, of people to 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 use the tools and to to engage with the process. Or please, if you have any other points you would like to raise, I think I it was Akbe Akbobli who was who first raised his hand or her hand. Thank you. As uh, I said it earlier, I'm from Togo. And uh, we did have uh, an experiment with the CDM, the, the, the tool uh, MAD. So we did uh, launch the tools. We had uh, a product using uh, the cocoa cross of Build. So we did use, uh, we did follow all the steps of the tools. Uh, so when it's come to data collection, um, I see that uh, it was a little bit difficult because uh, at the beginning, you uh, you have to talk to the uh, tax collection people, uh, tax people for order to get the data. But uh, we came back uh, and uh, we reviewed uh, the composition of our team. So we do have our producers and uh, it was much easier to deal with them. So with uh, the exchange that we have, uh, we were able to understand that uh, this product was not on the market. And uh, we did uh, readjust the price of the product and accord to what's happening in the market. Uh, today, we do it's a very uh, unique product from FFF, and uh, we are trying to uh, sensitize in the cooperative. So we had the same uh, experience with coffee. So we were able to produce uh, soap, and uh, this uh, help us to uh, have the product uh, on the market. So this is... Uh, the experience that we have uh, using this tool. So I think uh, we have adopted it as uh, a working tool. Thank you. Thank you very much for this recount of your, of your experiences, um, especially around data collection. I was wondering whether Isabel and Jacques had anything to add to this discussion at this point. Uh Yes, I would like well, for, for just uh, what we earn right now. Uh, when when you say uh, we, enfin, en français, mais we we have uh, done the experimentation. We have collected the data. Who you mean? Who are you? Are you who, who is behind that? Is it the, is it the FFPO as a whole? Is it an individual? Is it the entrepreneur? I don't understand very well. So this is a question to Togo. Yes. Bobli. No, it's the group, the cooperative. We are talking about cooperative. Cooperative who have launched the product. And the cooperative is the one who launched the product. So what uh, we are doing, we're not working with individuals, we are working with cooperatives. Merci. Parce que, comme vous, no, I will speak in English. As you mentioned uh, that uh, you did not get the reliable information uh, at the beginning, then you send back the producer to get the information. And then they could get more information. So, so that's why I was, I was a bit puzzled of who, who was doing what. No? 
So, and to come back on on the uh, what what you said from Madagascar and experience also in some other areas where, uh, in some contexts, the uh, education level or, or the of the of the local people is very low. So they are not uh, actually. Uh, very involved and, and even willing to become entrepreneur. I think it's something to consider because there are some contexts where if it, uh, it will be very difficult not to apply MND because it is not the point to apply MND is to start small enterprises. The enterprise development is something a little bit complicated and which requires a minimum of skills. And in some context, I, 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 I'm, I, we already faced that many times. Uh, the, the people are not uh, ready uh, yet for that, so the process will take longer time, and and uh, maybe some interim. Uh, you have to stop the MND process and, and right away enterprise development with some other, uh, let's say, livelihood improvement activities or first and to slowly, slowly teach them about some uh, financial issues, management issues uh, that will lead them to be more mature and start enterprise development later. And that means a bit delaying the, the fact of using MND for enterprise development. Otherwise, I mean, you may end up with the facilitator or the organization doing MND for them and which which will not lead anywhere. That's a bit my point. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. I think that's um, that's a very you're offering some very good solutions there. Um, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, I want to react uh, to what uh, Madame Isabel has said. Indeed, for now we are working a lot on the issue of financing small uh, enterprises because uh, indeed uh, the challenge is uh, about the means because even if the producer understand what needs to be done to become an entrepreneur, they do not have uh, finan financial means to use. So for now we are we are teaching them how they can create uh, maybe systems, financing, uh, community financing system. We are also trying to collaborate uh, and uh, have a network with uh, microfinance enterprises in order to facilitate the launching of uh, small enterprises. That is all I have to say. Yes, uh, just to answer, yeah, we need to have uh, uh, in, uh, a, a good environment so that later on uh, they can uh, establish enterprise, uh, uh, their own enterprises. Thank you. Thank you, Wangi. Thank you, Isabel. Um, Unless um, there are any major issues that you would like to talk about. Uh, yes, please, I can see the hand up of Asimio. Greetings, I'm from Togo. And uh, specifically, Rejopat, a network of young uh, producer in Togo. Back in 2019, when uh, we started, we launched the mechanism Octefa was a member of uh, the network uh, and they benefited uh, from support from uh, FFPO. So we had a training on uh, MED, which was uh, done uh, during the month of August. Uh, and uh, another one uh, uh, in October, 2019. So after this training, uh, the network used the MED uh, tools so that uh, they can develop their enterprises. First of all, they uh, use uh, a tool which was used during the training. These uh, enable them to come up with uh, a business plan. 
so that uh, they can uh, access uh, a, a credit from a microfinancing firm. Uh, at the beginning, uh, it was within uh, the fair and fair project. So this is how uh, they use uh, their business plan to get the credit, but uh, they were not successful. But uh, the business plan was uh, also submitted uh, to another financial entity so that uh, they can access a credit in order to develop uh, activities of the cooperative because uh, they are processing a local uh, product uh, such as uh, ginger juice and uh, other product. So before the training, MAD, our cooperative didn't have enough tools to enable them to become a real enterprise. So all, all they had, they didn't have a, a bank account, uh, a management register, so the cooperative didn't have uh, all these things. So it's after the MAD tools that uh, they started using those tools. And then uh, the, another the tools uh, on uh, marketing, how to link uh, consumer with the product. Uh, it was uh, launched uh, and uh, now the cooperative has uh, many uh, customers who are buying those products. Beyond that, uh, I think that uh, the uh, site of the cooperative is closed to a forest. Uh, through a sacred forest. So, and this is where the cooperative has tried to develop the tools so, so that uh, they can teach them to conserve or to manage the forest. So this is uh, our experience that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for telling us this, uh, this experience, telling us about your experience. It's always very good to to hear from other countries um, that I don't know much about personally and, and about your cases. Um, uh, just one last comment from Edwin, and then I would like to move ahead in our agenda. Please, Edwin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Edwin from Kenya. I just wanted to share an, uh, an experience we had with one group and, uh, and uh, how MND can be very helpful in selecting uh, viable enterprises. So we, we had a group uh, that we were working with and the group, uh, uh, the name was Junction Bamboo Group. As the name says, they dealt with bamboo. But then after we went through the MND process uh, under the FFF program, uh, they, they had uh, shortlisted a number of products uh, one of them being bamboo, another being avocados, and another one being honey. But then after we did the market survey and collected data and uh, analyzed this data, uh, we found out that uh, the data uh, favored bamboo, uh, not bamboo, but avocados. But many of the members of the group wanted to, to go ahead with bamboo because they had, uh, they had had a project in the area that had been donor funded and uh, most of them had planted bamboo in their lands. But then if you, when you looked at the things like availability of quality jump plasm, the profit margins, the time that it took to recoup the investment, all these factors favored uh, avocado. Uh, and especially at that time, uh, that was uh, back in 2017, the international market for avocado was very promising. So uh, out of the 30 people or so that we had started with, they were split like, uh, say, let's say half half, uh, some supporting bamboo, others supporting uh, avocado. But then uh, eventually they all went with avocado. And uh, at the moment, they, out of the 30 people, so uh, many more adopted avocado. And uh, we have uh, uh, around 200 people who have formed a cooperative from that. And looking back, you can see that. Uh, uh, avocados are really good choice because of the incomes they're getting and, uh, you know, the, 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 the way it has changed the, uh, you know, the incomes from, uh, uh, by, by the farmers. 
So uh, maybe without A and B, we would never have picked avocados or they would never have picked avocados. But right now they're doing very well. So uh, that, that, that is evidence that uh, M and D can be very, very helpful in selecting uh, viable enterprises. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. I think this was a wonderful story to tell and um, very clearly told also. Um, um, perhaps we should get to make you some kind of video, some promotional video for M A N D retelling the story. That would be great. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you again. Um, I would now like to uh, share my screen again. Um, we're still talking about step two of phase two. And um, we talked about, um, uh, sorry, I've gone way too far in my script, sorry. Um, so we've talked about how um, the data collectors come back to the group and they share the results. Um, um, and I think it's, well, I don't just think that, I, I know that it's important for the for the whole group to be present when these uh, when these results are shared. Um, also because not everyone is fixed on one product yet. So they will really benefit from hearing about the different, the data that has been collected for the different pre-selected pre -selected products. Um, and this is also the moment where some of the national survey results or the national survey results um, should be shared. And that of course can be, um, uh, this kind of information we've talked about the different sources and we've talked about the diff the, the important role of forest producer organizations the sort of higher level organizations in acquiring this kind of data from an at a national level um and it's also important to for the the entrepreneurs um together with the facilitator um to assess how reliable the collected information is um uh, so then once the the data is shared, the um, it, it will be analyzed by the entrepreneurs um, and this will be done in a product assessment table. So this is where uh, the entrepreneurs list all the opportunities and pos positive aspects of each product and then they list the constraints that need to be overcome in order to improve the current status of this, this product. Um, and if not already done, these opportunities and constraints are then classified within the five areas of business development. And the entrepreneurs also um, workshop and discuss possible solutions to these constraints that were identified. Um, and there may be new selection criteria that emerge from these discussions, something that they will then need to add to, to the different criteria they have already established for the areas um, and they may also find that they need to organize a second round of data collection if there are still some gaps there so it's an iterative process and it takes some time um, and of course this product assessment table should be filled in not just for the pre-selected products but perhaps during the research um, new new product ideas came up so they should also be then of course analyzed in this way um, and then uh, the entrepreneurs rank the different products. So first of all, um, um, uh, sorry, you decide on the scoring um, convention. So a positive feature will, 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 will get high points, a major constraint will get low, a low score. And then you assign, or the, sorry, the entrepreneurs assign scores um, for each product according to the different criteria they have identified. And then once the, all the products are scores, scored, um, the, the total is, is, uh, is calculated and the scores can be compared. So these scores really are, they're not to say this is the, this is the final, this is the basis for our final decision. This product scored very high, therefore we're gonna go for this. And this one scored very low, so we're going to dismiss this. But it's really an indicator of strengths and weaknesses in the different areas of enterprise development. So it's not a precise measuring tool. And there should be, the scoring should then be discussed and analyzed. Um,
Yes, and what I also wanted to point out is that the the sort of strength and weaknesses that the entrepreneurs identify through the scoring um, is really the, the subtotals of the scores for each area sort of give an indication of particular strengths or weaknesses of certain products in certain areas or so something that um, then needs to be um, uh, considered and and looked into as they as they if they choose this product to to develop into an enterprise. Okay, um, let's move on. So we have about 20 minutes left and I just wanted to touch on step three. Um, and I've I've um, gone a little bit over time for the other on the other topics because I know that we've already had some discussion around this step three at the beginning of our session today. So step three is of course where the entrepreneurs reflect on the most appropriate form of enterprise. And um, I just wanted to highlight here that it's the facilitator's role really to help the entrepreneurs identify the most appropriate kind of enterprise or enterprise group. But the starting point is always the actual situation of the entrepreneurs at that present time. So for existing groups, the facilitator should help them determine whether their current situation is appropriate for the enterprise they want to establish. Um, and of course, for existing groups, it's advisable to build upon the existing structures as long as its purpose is in line with the MAND principle of economic empowerment in a positive social context. Um, so the role of the facilitator is to help um, entrepreneurs assess whether their current organization meets those requirements of an enterprise group and whether it has good management practices. And this was the slide that I had mentioned at the very beginning of a session um, coming up now. Um, so this is just um, a list of the sort of good management practices um, you could discuss with entrepreneurs. So an enterprise group needs at a minimum a chairperson, a secretary, a treasurer, and of course members, and men and women should both be re represented. Um, then you need to have rules governing all the activities of the enterprise group. Um, so there should be some regulations drafted, they should be known by everyone and adhered to by all. Um, then you also then you need to decide on the frequency of, um, of the, the meetings of this enterprise group. So there should be some kind of um, regular timetable and the enterprise group should meet according to this timetable and according to, of course, the needs um, and how often they should meet. Um, then. Um, it's really also important to set the level of authority for the group to make and implement decisions. So the, the group needs to be able to make decisions. So there needs to be some clarity around who has which authority in, in the group around decision-making. Um, it's always good to encourage, ensure that women are encouraged to participate in the decision-making of the enterprise, enterprise group. So they should also be active members of the management team. Um, they should attend the meetings, so um, the groups need to make sure that the meetings are conducted in a situation where women are free to participate, um, and and they should women should also be part of the decision making process in an in an ideal world. Um, the enterprise group also needs to consider how it's going to um, to fund itself and. And um, group members could contribute funds to guarantee sustainability of the group. So this could be either a contribution by everyone, uh, the same contribution by everyone, or it could be calculated on the degree of involvement or the ability to pay. I think what is, and we talked about this before, what is what is the most important is transparency and a communal decision around um, how finances are handled. Um, and also um, the, the possibility to adapt this, this, um, this setup as, as you go along and you see that there may be problems coming up. Um, we've also talked about the importance this, of um, considering the social aspects uh, around an enterprise. So this is also where um, you could have the 
group could have um, a bylaw describing um, members' regular contributions to a community development fund. Um, of course, um, very important for the group is to have um, uh, financial records. So they, they must describe the cash flows, money coming in, going out, and the information should be in the public domain. So it should be transparent and available to all members. Um, um, we talked already about decision-making processes um, and the there should also be a system that describes the participation of everyone. So how members and other contributors can participate and how their participation is recognized within the group. Um, you could also organize a discussion with the entrepreneurs to reflect on how their existing structure can be modified. And these could be some guiding questions in this, in this discussion. So what could be the composition of an enterprise group? Who manages the group? What is a perfectly functional group? What are its strengths? How do you envision that? How could a group be efficient and managed in a transparent matter, manner? And what does a group need to do to ensure its sustainability? So generate the solutions, um, the answers to these questions from within the group. Um, and then, of course, um, if groups are not yet formed, um, there are certain there are certain elements that you might want to consider as a facilitator in that situation. So try to encourage making up groups based on different types of products um, that individuals have chosen to develop. Um, reflect also on the, on the benefits with them around collaboration. Um, so this could be that as a group, they produce, can produce larger quantities, they can obtain a better quality product, um, or they, they can produce better quality products, they can share costs for technology or perhaps there are other reasons. Um, uh, assess also what information already exists in the group on different forms of enterprises and whether it is best to register or not, um, and if yes, when. And this is, of course, always going to be dependent on your national context and the rules and regulations around registration. You may, you may also decide to invite some external advisors. You could um, explain the local possibilities to, to the entrepreneurs and how they could form groups and in what form. Um, and it may also be a good idea to start informally. Um, and then as production increases, um, um, you could then become more formalized as a group. They could become more formalized as a group. Um, and of course, I wanted to also point out that um, entrepreneurs may decide to be members of several groups if they have such aspirations and capacities. Okay, so these were all the slides I wanted to share with you today. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and perhaps in these 10 minutes, if you can think back at everything that we discussed today, um, all the, the, the different steps of the second phase, are there particular questions and, and things that you would like to clarify? And this is your chance. Tomorrow we're going to talk about phase three. Uh, we have our two master trainers, Isabel and Jack, pre present. So please, we have 10 minutes. Hi, right, Kata. Yes, please, Mark. Yes, I just wanted to reemphasize, um, especially the need for what um, uh, Isabel mentioned about the fact that you need to regularly review um, aspects of the uh, enterprise development plan, uh, preferably on an annual basis to make it in tandem with the current situations uh, uh, available in terms of um, especially the market system and of course um, other areas uh, such as the environment that you find yourself because definitely we do not live in a static environment and so um, there might be changes especially in the market situation and of course the risk that uh, can affect uh, the business. So an opportunity to be um, much more flexible and make sure that the document is not uh, that static and that uh, you are providing an opportunity for uh, regular growth in terms of um, your plans, especially in terms of your uh, marketing plans uh, would be very, very useful. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Isabel, did you want to react? 
No, I, I can I can uh, just confirm. Yeah, I'm very very true. But uh, not not of course market market aspect is very important. But let's say also we have to be uh, very careful about the the uh, context uh, law in uh, rules and regulation, which actually affect a lot the the changes on, on in enterprise in terms of pricing in terms of. Uh, uh, amount of tax in terms of cost, in terms of, of, of transportation, many, many aspects on, 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 on uh, resource availability, restriction to resource availability, exemption of tax. All this may change uh, every year. I mean, the, you, you may have some changes in terms of legal issues every year. So this is also an area which is, is, is to be taken in consideration on a yearly basis, at least. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Marc. I can see the hand up of Musu Hudu. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Sophia. I'm from Togo. I want you to come back on uh, the participative community development. I want to know how can this fund will uh, contribute to the good management. I would like to have more clarity on the issue. Thank you. Yeah, so this is about the community development fund that I mentioned. Um, so um, I think uh, the purpose here is to understand that um, if you set up an enterprise, it will always be in a community context. And uh, within this context, you might provide some really positive benefits to the community members as your as your your in your enterprise activities but there might also be some negative aspects um, um, and the idea of this community fund is to 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 sort of have a contribution of the entre entrepreneurs towards an, a, a fixed a concrete visible contribution um, to to move their community up to 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 give them back um but um i think this could also be a situation where um and i really need isabel and jack to correct me on this if i'm wrong but um if you if you are using for example community forest resources for your for your enterprise there needs to be a system in which you you give the community back uh, because you're making a profit on these on these these community from these community assets. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, perhaps Isabel Jacques could confirm or correct me. Yeah, personally, I agree with you. And uh, But it, it may take a lot of different forms according to the context. Uh, for example, if, if your enterprise is uh, using a lot of water, you may uh, uh, think about contributing to upgrade uh, uh, the, the water uh, system in the in the community or or whatever it can be so yes it's a, it's a really good link to 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 make sure that the social aspects are, are are very much taken into consideration in the enterprise development that you are engaged in yeah thank you Isabel Jacques please yes it may be another subject, but I think we have not discussed so much about what type of enterprise. That means in the enterprise, who is going to do what? That is to say, uh, because I saw in different EDP that we, we got, that there is some mixed understanding between what an enterprise is going to do effectively Okay, and what the member of the group are doing effectively. I don't know if I am clear. I'm going to try to explain. I saw in the, uh, often we mix the idea that uh, everyone has to participate in the enterprise, you see, and uh, uh, after that, there is a problem of sharing the profit according how long the one has been working in. So I think it's very important to be very clear 
does the enterprise will what the enterprise will do effectively according to the information we got from the market okay that's all what i wanted to include thank I'm you Jacques. Very yes very clear we try to see this tomorrow also during the edp yes but if we don't if we are not clear about this then after that problems start on the longer run what the who will be managing the enterprise is it the group or if it is different people how the profit will be shared also that has to be very clear and that will be done according to the activities of the enterprise which is yeah. difficult to mix some common activities that are done at the forest level for example going to the forest and collecting the raw material as medicinal plants or firewood or whatever and uh, uh, the business of the enterprise does the enterprise is going include in its activities the fact to go in the forest and to collect the raw material or does the enterprise do not include this activity and the enterprise is not is just there for example storing the material and after that selling or only selling or all this i think is need to be very very clear once before you start anything Yes, thank you, Jacques. And uh, we've sort of talked about this, this a little that's bit in the morning. Yes, thank you. And uh, and that's also what I try to highlight in terms of uh, having a transparent system and and decision taking together on how how things will be set up. And if this is a point that we still need to discuss, I'm very happy tomorrow morning when we do our recap of today to 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 pick up on this point again. Um, um, and I also would like to encourage for you to now hold your questions, if you have any on today, until tomorrow, where we have time to discuss again briefly on what we talked about today, because today we have to really finish on time. And um, and I, I would like to also encourage you to think about everything that we discussed today. And perhaps if there are any issues that you now remember, ah, yes, when we did step two or step one of phase two there was this problem please tomorrow there is time for you to 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 bring this up and 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 we can we can talk about it and tomorrow we will then um, discuss the first two steps of of phase three um so that's going to be a big day um and now for now i would like to say goodbye to everyone thank you so much for your active participation it was lovely to have you with us really enjoying this thank you so much <laughs>